Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's talk. Our speaker is Alfonso de la Rocha. Before joining Protocol Labs, Alfonso worked as a blockchain expert at Telefonica R&D, where he was responsible for the design and development of core technology based on blockchains, distributed systems, and advanced cryptography. Since coming to Protocol Labs, Alfonso has had a huge impact on the output of our Resilient Networks Lab. In addition to his exceptional skills as a research engineer, he's also brought his amazing gift for scientific communication through his blog posts, many of which pertain to today's talk on his recent project, Beyond Swapping Bits. If you want to be the next Alfonso, ResNet Lab is hiring an additional research engineer. You can find a link to the job description in the talk description. Alfonso, it is great to have you here. I'll, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you, Jonathan. I, I wasn't expecting that introduction, to be honest. <laughs> I was expecting the previous one. And as Jonathan said, I mean, if you want to become uh, the next resident lab research engineer, please ping us because we need, we need manpower and woman power. <laughs> so today I'm here to talk about um, all the work that we've been doing around trying to accelerate file sharing peer-to-peer -peer networks. We call this project Be Beyond Swapping Bits or Beyond Bitswap because in the end, what we're trying to go is like faster than Bitswap or as fast as we can. Because like what maybe everyone knows by now is that file exchange in peer-to-peer -peer networks is hard because you have to worry about content discovery, content resolution, about the delivery of the content and all of this with any kind of central point of coordination. And this is hard. I mean, you have to check where the content is, find someone that can deliver the content and ask him to deliver the content. Fortunately, there are a lot of content routing systems out there to help in this task. For instance, BitTorrent has trackers so that you can go to the tracker and find who has the, the content that you're looking for. If we go to the web 2.0, we have DNS. In the end to DNS, what we are asking is, hey, I want this resource, where, is it? where it is located, what is the IP? of the resource uh, I'm looking for. And then we have um, in peer to peer networks, we all know about the DHT that helps us find peers and content in the network. Unfortunately, all of them have their trade-offs. If we go to BitTorrent uh, trackers, they are kind of central. They are not as, not as distributed as we would like for. If we go to the DNS, we have a decentralized system that is centralized governed. So it may not be the best option for a decentralized network. And if we go to the DHC, when we're talking about large networks, what we may realize is that um, making queries into the DHC and or, or interacting with the DHC may be slow. So for all of these, um, we started framing BitSwap. I mean, I'm going to introduce BitSwap and then the work that we've been doing in the Beyond Swapping Bits project. But with BitSwap, what we're trying to do in the end is to help content routing subsistence to overcome their trade-offs in one way or another, either through um, increased speed or helping in the, um, in the discovery of content faster than having to do a slow lookup. So BitSwap in the end is a message oriented protocol that its aim is to overcome the trade-offs or some of the trade-offs that I've mentioned from the uh, content routing systems above. Um, this is the architecture of Bitswap. In the end, Bitswap exposes a really simple interface. That is, it has two main uh, operation, a get and a put. Uh, in the get operation, what we're saying is, hey, please, uh, Bitswap, get me this block from the network, wherever it is. And with the put one, what we're saying is, put this, uh, tell the network and announce to the network that I'm storing this block. And um, in BitSwap, we follow a modular architecture where these different models have their own responsibility. Uh, we have this connection manager because in the end, the idea is that BitSwap could work. I mean, BitSwap is used in IPFS as the exchange interface. So every time that we um, exchange content in IPFS, we do it through BitSwap and also is used in Filecoin for block synchronization. But BitSwap could be used anywhere, even in isolation, to find content in a network. And what BitSwap does is to leverage the network interface from the node within it operates. So we have a connection manager that, in the end, it orchestrates the, the, um, the, me the message exchange and, and the interaction with other nodes in the network, leveraging the network interface that is in place. In the case of, of IPFS, the network interface, of course, is, li is lib 2 peer So through lib 2 peer we have this transport in order to orchestrate this exchange of messages with other nodes in the network. Then we have the ledger. And here in the ledger, what we are tracking is the, 
the so whenever a Bitswap node receives a request, we track this um, this request in the ledger to know what peers as are asking for what. So in this way, whenever we get in, I mean, this ledger uh, interacts with the block store. In the block store, we have stored all of the blocks from the content that, I, that we're currently storing in our node. So through the ledger, we are able to know who's requesting what, and we are able to forward the blocks that we are storing to them in case like someone, we'll see in a moment how, in case someone uh, wants a specific blog and we have it in our blog store so that we can provide him with, with the content. And then we have the session manager because uh, in whenever we try to find content in Bitswap, what we do is to trigger a new session. And in the session, again, we'll see in a moment, but in the session, what we do is aggregate peers that potentially can store that content. So the session manager is the one that orchestrates all of these uh, adding new peers to the session and orchestrating the back and forth of messages to request the content and, and find its content. And the session manager interacts directly with a content routing interface that uh, it allows him to, I mean, I mean, sessions will try to find content either interacting with neighbors of all, I mean, my own neighbors or making queries into a providing subsystem that it, this providing subsystem can be any providing subsystem available in the network. So Bitswap could leverage as long as it has the interface to interact with it. Uh, in IPFS, it leverages the DHT to find peers that potentially has the content in the network, but we could think of any other driver to find these potential peers storing the content. And we'll see in a moment that uh, one of the things we did in the Beyond Swapping Bits project, and, and actually uh, we recently uh, wrote a paper with all of these contributions, one of the things we do is add new models in order to try and extend the behavior of Bitswap to overcome some of these, of these limitations. And um, by the way, if there's, I can't access the chat, so feel free to like send questions or interrupt me. Jonathan, I don't know if you can interrupt me if there's another question because I don't know why I can't see the Zoom chat. Great, so before we start, I mean, so we have Bitswap. Bitswap, the, the goal was to, I mean, the, the goal of Bitswap is to try and overcome some of the trade-offs of using uh, vanilla providing a subsystem or content routing subsystem in, the, in itself. And uh, before we start um, describing the operation, uh, it is worth mentioning briefly how Bitswap understand content because uh, if you're familiar with IPFS, this is uh, your bread and butter. But whenever we have a file, we chunk it into different blocks, and these blocks are uniquely identified through a CID, a content identifier, that usually is related with the hash of the of the content in that block. And blocks can be um, organized uh, and linked one to another. Uh, following some kind of DAX structure as this one. So in this DAX structure, we may be storing a full file system. We may be storing a bunch of files or, I mean, these, these blocks may represent a lot of types of, of content. And um, why I'm saying this, because the request pattern, so and the content that we want to access in the network and how we access it, we will, um, <clears throat> will influence the way in which Bitswap will operate. Because for instance, let's consider this as the DAX structure for a file, for a full file. And um, if we want to get this content from the network, this full file, what Bitswap will have to do is to first ask for the CID root, because in this CID root, we have the links for the next level. We will uh, get this block, inspect the links, and then get information about the blocks in the next level that we have to gather. So once we have this information, we can gather the blocks for the next level and on and on for all the levels, because in the end, when we want to check, I mean, when we want to get a full file, where, where we want is all the blocks in the DAX structure. So, so we will have to go from the root, traverse the tree back until the last level, until the leaves, so that we get all the content for that file. This is one of the common request patterns uh, that we'll see in Bitswap and one common request pattern in IPFS. And then uh, we have the other common request pattern in which instead of like trying to find, um, uh, I mean, instead of like downloading a full file, what we want is a file within a, a path. And in this case, instead of getting all of the blocks for all the levels in the DAC, what we do is traverse the path through the DAC structure until we get 
to the to the file that we want and this is what happens when for instance we are uh, rendering a web page uh, or the, getting the assets to render our web page from ipfs we go to the parent i mean we have to get this root cid for the parent of the path which go down to the next level to get the link of the next um the next level of the path so instead of like here where we were getting all the plugs we won't go we follow the path until we get to the file that we were looking for. So this is actually how Bitswap will operate. In the case of full files, what it will do is request first the, the root CID and from there all the blocks in each level, or it will traverse block per block the path until it gets to the file it is looking for. So imagine that we want to get a file in, in IPFS, for instance. I mean, this would Bitswap would work uh, and, uh, similarly in, in in isolation or where in any other uh, system, but let's put the example of IPFS. Whenever we want to find a file in IPFS, what we say is, hey, I want to get this CID. The first thing that IPFS, the IPFS client does is to check in the block store if it has blocks or any of the blocks comprising that content. And if the, this is not the case, it goes to Bitswap and it triggers a new session to find all the blocks uh, for that, uh, for the content uh, identified with that CID. IPFS, um, ha, it's a message oriented protocol, as I've said, and it has three main requests and, and three main responses that we'll see in a moment. There is the one half request, what, that what it's doing is like to ask other peers if uh, they store the, the content. If this is the case, they will respond with a, with a half message saying, hey, indeed, I'm storing this content, but they don't send the, the, the actual content. In, in this case, I mean, uh, Bitswap asked for blocks, not full content. We'll see in a moment. But yeah, the one half you have a list of of CIDs, so you are asking for a list of blocks, and the 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 um, the other peer will answer with half or don't have according to if it stores or not the content. Then we have the one block uh, request. That what it does is like request and not only uh, request information about if it's storing the content, but if the peer we're con we're interacting with stores the content you're requesting to him to send the block and in this case like the answer to a one block it's either the block or i don't have and then finally the cancel message that is a special message used to um, remove ourselves from the ledger of the other peers we're interacting with to the i mean to remove us from the ledger of the peers in our session we'll see this in a moment. So as I said, when we want to find content in the IPFS network, we do get a CID. And the first thing that Bitswap does is to try and uh, it triggers a new session to try and find who's storing this um, root block in order to get knowledge about the rest of the structure of the DAX structure for the content. So when a new session is triggered, the first thing that Bitswap does is to broadcast a one half message for the root CID of the content to all of its connections. So it leverages the current established connections of the node and broadcast a one half to all of them. And in the meantime, in parallel, it leverages one of these uh, content routing uh, systems available in the network. In the case of IPFS is the DHT. So it performs a query to the DHT in order, in case none of the neighbors store the content uh, to have a way of finding a potential provider for the, the root CID of the content that we are trying to look for. So according, I mean, we send this one half with the, with the root CID to our neighbors and we perform a, a, in parallel a, a DHT query that it may be slow or to any other content routing system. And according to their answer, so here we see that these three peers are answering with a half saying, hey, indeed, I'm storing uh, the root CID for, for the content you're looking for. Um, what we what we do as the node that is looking for the content is to add these three peers as uh, into the session because um, I mean if they're storing uh, our assumption is that if they're storing the root uh, CID for the content we're looking for they potentially have all of the uh, remaining blocks in the in the content uh, that we are seeking. So um, we broadcast everyone, we get knowledge of who's storing the root CID. And from there, the next thing that we do is add, ask for the actual block in order to inspect the links to the, to the next level. And uh, what is the view? So this is the view from me that I'm looking for the content. But I told you that 
the other nodes also track what others are requesting in order to know if they have the if, if they're able to to respond to the content or not so if we are peer a and we are broadcasting to some of these peers like for instance peer b we send like a few want messages for, uh, for a few CIDs. And what happens in the peers I'm sending the request to is that they track my want list in order to know what is the content and where are the blocks that I'm looking for. So the moment that PUB gets, uh, either it's storing already the block into the, in his blog store or, or it receives the block from somewhere else, it can, straight like directly send the block back because in its ledger it knows that I am looking for C81. So this is just to give you a view of what, I mean, I'm broadcasting the request, but uh, in order for you to get a, a sense of what is happening in the other nodes uh, to whom I'm, I'm sending the request. Um, and I, so we did this broadcast uh, of what halves, uh, we got knowledge we see here for with halves of the different nodes that are storing the, the content. And the next thing that we do is at uh, the moment we receive a half from any of them, we send a one block requesting the transfer for that uh, root CD. So we broadcast one half, we start getting halves. And for the first half that we receive, we send a block, one block so that we get that root CID. And these one halves, are we, are, we also keep track of them because all of the ones that are answering with uh, a successful half, we will add them to the session because from there on, instead of broadcasting information to all of our connections, we will limit uh, our interactions with the peers that are inside our session. So from now on, like once we get the root CID, we don't broadcast anymore and we just interact with nodes that potentially have the content. So we're just going to interact with nodes in the session. From uh, So now we have the root CID and now the next thing that we do, we inspect the links and we are in a position to ask to have larger want list and ask for more blocks because in the next level we have uh, more blocks. We do the same thing. We send a bunch of one blocks uh, in order to the peers in the session. In this case, we only have B, C and D in the session. We send a bunch of, of one blocks for the next um, the next a bunch of blocks in the in the next level and we start getting like the blocks don't have and and like different patterns according if, to, if the nodes are storing the content or not uh, two things that we do also is that when i mean imagine that this peer for instance is answering with a lot of don't have for for a bunch of subsequent uh, requests what we do is that potentially he doesn't have any more the the um, the blog store in its blog store and it has no knowledge of the rest of the content in the DAX structure so we remove it from the session and if we end up removing all of the peers in the session what happens is that we need to leverage any of the content routing systems in order to populate again the session with potential uh, peers and in this way we go back and forth uh, with the peers like interacting with the peers in the session until we get we traverse all the DAX structure and we get all the blogs for the content. And this special cancel message. So, I mean, we're interacting with a lot of peers in the in the session. So in sessions, we have more than one peer. And in order to avoid um, peers in a session sending duplicate blocks when we already have a block. So let's see the example of peer A and peer B here. Imagine that we're sending like peer B, it's keeping one and two, uh, CID one and CID two in its one list because I've sent one request for them. And I received the block from another peer in the session. Then whenever I receive the block, what I do is broadcast a cancel message to all of the peers in my session in order to let them know that I already have the, the block and that they should remove that CID from the session so that I don't receive duplicate blocks. Because if, if I don't do this, what it would happen is that all the peers in the session that I've sent requests to, they will, uh, the moment they get the block, they will be forwarding the block back even if, I'm, if I already have it. And this is briefly how BitSwap works, like broadcast a bunch of one half and one blocks to our neighbors and leveraging content routing subsistence to traverse the DAG and get all the, um, all the blocks from the, for the content. And as I've said, like one of the things and one of our assumptions of what was BitSwap for is that it's a way of, of like uh, overcoming the trade-offs of content routing subsistence. So one of the things that we did is, is say, 
let's see how fast is BitSwap on getting this first block compared to a DHT lookup. So, I mean, this, so we, we built a testbed to do all of these tests and, and emulate different size of networks. And here, what we did is to have a bunch, a dozen of, of nodes um, with just one seeder and the rest leachers trying to gather a block from the seeder. So all the leachers will try to, to, to get the, a single block from the seeder. And what we realized is that BitSwap, it's faster than the, all of the beers are connected one to, I mean, in a mesh uh, topology, so all, all of the uh, all of the peers are co connected to each other. So BitSwap, with this broadcast and this one having one block, finds the content, floats the network, and finds the content uh, faster than having to make a DHT query. But of course, there's a trade-off in the case of of the um, of the DHT. You always find the content, and for BitSwap, if you don't have uh, if none of your neighbors have the content, you don't have a way of finding that content. So this is the trick. But that's why it's so interesting to use BitSwap uh, in addition to a content routing system, because what we do is like, we can use the DHC to find the initial providers and then use BitSwap once we establish the connection with this initial provider, we are able to, instead of having to perform another DHC query to find the next CID, we are able to directly interact with the nodes that we found through the DHT query to uh, gather the content through BitSwap instead of having to do uh, query. So, so that's why we mean that BitSwap tries to overcome the content routing because it uses the DHT to perform like this, populate the session and get the first uh, potential providers for the content. And from there on, BitSwap takes it from there and leverages the connections that it has established to get the content. Um, so up to here is how BitSwap works and how we framed BitSwap in, in IPFS and, and as a way of, of improving a file sharing peer-to-peer -peer networks. But we realized when we were doing all of this, we realized certain things. Uh, uh, and this is how the Beyond Swapping Bits project started. First of all, uh, BitSwap, it's, I mean, there's no one size fits all implementation to, that may shoot every use case because we see that, for instance, in BitSwap, what we do is that we, still, I mean, we have to go block per block, getting the content, and for certain use cases, this may be slowed or, or it may have some uh, limitations, and the use case doesn't have a way of configuring the protocol so that it uh, operates in the way that better suits it. So one of the things that we started uh, considering when we started the project is how can we uh, make BitSwap aware of the use case so that it can be fine-tuned, uh, its operation can be fine-tuned to leverage like the request pattern for the use case or any other um, information, previous information that we have so that uh, BitSwap can work uh, more in a more performant way. The other thing that we realize is that BitSwap does a blind and deterministic uh, search for content. So in the end, in the request, we are sending just a list of blocks and that's it. So we send a first list of blocks, we get the blocks, we inspect the next few blocks that we have to ask for and, and we go back and forth uh, sending just a list of blocks. And with all of the IP, I mean, with all of the work being done around IPLD and so on, uh, like for instance, uh, with IPLD selectors, uh, we could come up with more with smarter queries so that instead of asking for a list of blocks, we can ask for complex queries where we say, hey, I wanna get all this branch uh, of this data structure because that's what I'm interested for uh, in. Or, hey, I want like, this is a video stream, so I want to buffer these bunch of leaves and only use like these indexer, indexers to use it as frame in order to go through the, um, like to, to select other time in the video and, and go through the video. So, uh, I mean, with the current implementation of BitSwap, we had these limitations that it, it is not use case aware and it, it doesn't use previous information from events in the network and, and the use, uh, I mean, why, for what BitSwap is being used. And also like by using these smarter requests, we could uh, start doing things like sending non-overlapping uh, requests to several peers so that we leverage multipath to get more download 
or, or a faster downloads and so on. And, and we even uh, realized that maybe we could do a more efficient use of bandwidth. In the end, there were a lot of ideas. We did a, a state of the art evaluation and we came up with a bunch of RFCs and this is an ongoing work. So I'm gonna talk about some of the ones that we prototyped and some of the results that we achieved. But there are a lot of ideas that we, didn't, that we didn't have time to prototype. There are a lot of ideas that are already being discussed and proposed. So I highly recommend everyone to take a look at this report to, I mean, join the discussion, give feedback, or tinker with the testbed and the, and the prototypes. So this is how I introduced the architecture of Bitswap. And after implementing some of our prototypes for the RFCs that we came up with after like all of these realizations about the limitation of Bitswap. This is the architecture we came up with. So we added, first of all, uh, I mean, the first thing that we um, that we start wondering is like, come on, we are, I mean, HTTP already uses compression to make a more efficient use of bandwidth. Why not using compression also for for BitSwap and, and, and to, to make a more efficient use of, of bandwidth. So we'll see in a moment how we explore the use of, of compression in BitSwap. The other thing that we were mentioning is like, um, we're not using pure information of events in the network or what is happening in, in BitSwap or around us to make smarter, uh, smarter search. So one of the things that we added is this peer block registry that is pretty similar to the ledger. And what it does is track what others are requesting because if someone is looking for a CID, potentially we have the, that CID in the future. So we can leverage that information to make smarter discoveries of content and, and some, um, faster exchanges. And finally, um, if we wanted to, because as I've said, like if our neighbors don't have uh, the content and we don't have any content routing system available to populate the session and, and make that query, uh, we don't have a way of finding the content. So we added this relay manager and added uh, a TTL into the BitSwap uh, message so that instead of like uh, just asking our direct neighbors, we could jump a few hops away to discover content that may be a few hops from our neighbors so that instead of just asking our neighbors, we could ask the neighbors of our neighbors. So let's go in depth to all of these implementations and the results. The first one, as I've said, was, uh, I mean, we started wondering what happens if we use compression. So the first thing that we tried is like the same way we compress the payload in an HTTP request. Let's see what happens if we compress blocks. We got some, some improvements in terms of bandwidth, but the problem is that having to wait for the uh, compression of the block before we send the message was, um, we were incurring in, a, in an overhead that it wasn't worth the improvements in bandwidth that we were getting. So then we moved uh, one step further and we say, what if we use uh, a full compression strategy where instead of just compressing the, the blocks, we compress the full message that goes out. And again, the overhead was, uh, was not worth the, um, the bandwidth savings. And then we said, okay, and what if we use string compression so that every single byte that leaves the, the bit stream is compressed. And this one was the one that didn't introduce uh, that much overhead apart from like the, the obvious overhead of compression. And uh, it achieved um, um, higher rate of compression and bandwidth savings because in the end, like when we have a lot of uh, messages, um, I mean, messages have, BitSwap messages had, um, in the end, they, they share a lot of information uh, sometimes. And um, by using this string compression, we leverage the redundancy between different messages. And that's how we manage in certain. So we did a lot of tests that you can check here with different data sets from the, the IPFS awesome data sets uh, and different like um, configurations. And for some data sets, we managed with this string compression, we managed to achieve up to 75% of bandwidth savings. So it's a, it's a huge saving. And also like, um, once we got there, we were compressing, here we were compressing only the BitSwap stream, but we said, what if we go to a, to a transport level and instead of just compressing um, the BitSwap stream, let's see what happens if we compress every single leap P2P stream. So if we compress the transport, that leaves the node. And I mean, if you have a look at, at the blog post, you'll see that what we did is to add a new layer between the 
the muxer in the P2P and uh, and the transport level, so that um, every single stream was compressed before being sent through the transport. And again, like as a lot of the information of the streams is shared, there was an opportunity there to leverage all the redundancy for the different streams to achieve uh, higher compression. So this was one of the first prototypes that we explored in the in the project. The next thing that we did is what I mentioned of like inspecting the, the requests that were, were being sent by our neighbors so that we track, um, I mean, by tracking what is being uh, searched for, we have uh, some kind of knowledge of what is happening around us in the network and we can make better discoveries of content. So here, what we did is to inspect every one message that we received and track for each CID, the most recent peers that have a search for that specific CID. And instead of like, whenever we trigger a new session, instead of broadcasting to find uh, peers for that session, what we do in, in this prototype, what we did in this product, prototype is to avoid this broadcast. And the first thing to do is to check this pure block registry. So check this data structure that assigns for each CID, the peers that have more recently, most recently, um, requested that CID and sent directly a one block to the most recent peer that has asked the CID. I mean, what we're doing here is that instead of like having to do this one half to broadcast everyone and find who has the content and then request the content, as we had some knowledge of who has requested that content and potentially store it, we directly went to him to get the content. And what we, so we did a test here where we had like a single seeder and a bunch of leachers like in the other case. And in this case, instead of all trying to fetch at the same time the content, what we did is to um, have different waves of leachers asking for the content. So in this way, what we were trying to replicate is content that is popular in the, in the network. And what we see here is that by tracking this information about what others are requesting, we manage once, I mean, we managed to get like the, the request time down faster than in the case of the baseline bit swap. But also when this stabilizes and, and we have, I mean, the pure block registry has a lot of, of knowledge about what is going on in the network. And there are a lot of, of leachers that already have the content. What we see is that we reduce in one RTT the, the time to get a block if it's con a popular content. So if, it's, if, if we're talking about blogs that have been recently requested by others in the network. Here, I think that the, the latency of the network of the links of the different nodes was 100 milliseconds. So here you should see a full RTT of improvement uh, because instead of having this first broadcast that Bitswap usually does because it doesn't use previous information from the network and then the one block, we are sending a one block directly to the most recent peer for the CID we are looking for. The, the one that has requested that that CID most recently. And again, like we've been um, like publishing all of our um, thinking reflections and contributions in the research and the peer research blog. So if you want to go in depth of what we were trying and, and how we did it, take a look at these, at this link. And another uh, delightful benefit of using this is that by avoiding this broadcast of, of messages, we reduce the number of messages flowing in the network because instead of like having to uh, do this broadcast at this the one half, uh, we removed many of, of the messages required and, and removed the, the floating in the, in the network. So this was another interesting uh, implication of this of these prototype. And then the last um, prototype that we we explored was the use of these. So if we remove the DHT, what happens is that if we're not directly connected to the peer that stores the content, we don't have a way of, of finding it. So if we don't have content routing, uh, content routing system, we can't find the content if it's not stored in a network. So we said, what happens if we follow like a packet switching approach or, or, or a forwarding approach where we add a TTL to BitSwap messages so that requests can jump from our neighbors to um, a few hops away so that we have another way, an alternative way without having to, to resort on the DHT or, or other content routing system to find the content when it when it's not stored in the in the neighbor. And the behavior is pretty straightforward. Like let's wait for a moment until the give. Stops. 
So if this is Pirae and does this first broadcast, wait, this first broadcast of for to find the content, uh, the neighbors answer with uh, with uh, don't have, but. Uh, this wasn't a good idea, definitely, <laughs> like having this gift so fast. But like briefly, the, the um, so Pire will do these uh, broadcasts with uh, for to find who's storing the content and all of its neighbors answer with uh, don't have. But then we start a relay session from because at least has a TTL of one and it has enough hops to go. What my neighbors will do is forward that uh, request to its own neighbors to try and find uh, to see if any of them have the content. If this is the case, if one of them has the content, that's as, as it is the case here for Piri, I think, um, it will answer with, uh, with a half, and from there on, the session in Piri will interact with Piri using PUD as a session. So every single uh, request, so the same way that Piri will do with this session, uh, sending messages of one half and one block to PRD, the relay session would be uh, responsible for forwarding it to peer E and establishing the session between peer E and peer A so that peer A can gather the block from uh, peer E. So with this, what we were trying to do is to increase the range of, disco of discovery of Bitstrap without having to relay, uh, rely in any other uh, content routing subsystem. And we made another uh, bunch of tests over using the test over this prototype. And the first thing that we did, so for this test, what we did is like we had a, a single seeder, a bunch of features trying to find uh, content, and then a bunch of passive nodes. Passive nodes were nodes that were running the BitSwap protocol, but neither requesting nor um, or providing content. And seeders and leaders couldn't be directly connected. So in this way, we were forcing the content to be at least one hop away from the leaders. And we see that with the DHT, of course, the content. So the first thing is that if we don't have the DHT in place uh, and we use baseline bit swap, the content is never found because uh, it has no way of jumping the, the barrier of passive nodes and get to the seeder that has the, the content. Then if we enable the DHT, we see that uh, we find the content and, and we are able to, to establish the connection and take the block from it, uh, from the seeder in a decent amount of time. But then with the TTL, what we're doing is in the end, we are floating the network with requests uh, and we are able to uh, pass through the barrier of the passive nodes, get knowledge of where the content is and use the, those relays to, um, to get the content and go through those relays to get the content from the liter, from the seeder in the, the lectures. So we see that uh, by floating the network, this is faster. It, it has, I mean, if we go to the comparison between the DHT and BitSwap, it's kind of like the same behavior, but in this case, like we are increasing the, rate, increasing the range of discovery of BitSwap. And the other thing, so one thing that we realize is, okay, we have, so here is, this is just jumping BitSwap, so adding like this relay manager into the BitSwap implementation. And then we said, okay, we also have this prototype of one inspection and by forwarding um, requests from neighbors of our neighbors, we are getting requests a few hops away from us so that if we inspect them, we may be able to populate the peer block registry with more information and use this information in our favor to directly contact the ones that may have the content without having to broadcast this and reducing the number of messages in the in the in the network. And we see that actually this worked pretty well because in the end our pupil registry had more information and also we had this way of, of like jumping uh, the passive nodes and we managed to to improve a bit more the time to fetch uh, of the blocks, even with this barrier of passive nodes. Of course, again, this comes with a trade-off and here the trade-off is that the amount of duplicate blocks in the networks increase. Because in this case, we don't have a way, because I, I told you that this cancel message is used to signal all of the peers in the session that we don't want uh, that block anymore so that they don't send it to me. But the problem is that once we're using these relays, 
we send the cancel message to this. So this is a really simple topology, and in this topology, probably it wouldn't um, appear that behavior. But uh, when we have a lot of links between all of them, what it happens is that we may be using uh, pure D as a relay to pure E, but we don't have direct uh, connection to pure. So we don't have a way of giving feedback to all of the peers that pure D has interacted with to give this signal, this cancel, and, and avoid them sending me the, the block. And this is a consequence of using this symmetric approach where the request follows the same path. So the block follows the same path as the request. Um, we did another test where we used, instead of using a single block, a few blocks, we used large files. And what we realized is that by using this symmetric approach, we were producing uh, some amplification attacks because at the moment everyone starts flooding and when the network, there are a lot of nodes in the network, uh, we're flooding the network with blocks, with, with requests and so on. And in this case, it was a bit slower to use TTL compared to the DHT. But we, we thought, I mean, at least we think this is something that we haven't prototyped, but we should probably do, is to use an asymmetric approach. So use BitSwap uh, with the TTL as a way of discovery, the same way that we would do a DHC query, and then establish a connection directly from the one storing, so from the peer storing the, the content to the source, so that instead of having to have a lot of messages flowing through the relay that when we have a lot of leaders, this may be, uh, um, we may uh, result in this amplification attacks to have peer E establish the connection directly to peer A and send the block directly to him uh, instead of having to go through the relay, removing the number of duplicate blocks and removing the number of messages uh, flowing the network. Um, and this was the, the result for the jumping bit swap. Uh, as I said, there is, uh, this is an ongoing research, so uh, we're welcoming everyone that wants to, to take on and build upon the testbed that we build, the ideas. There are a lot of RFCs over there with some ideas that some are, some are ready for prototyping and others need a further discussions, but feel free to go to the repo and discuss them. There are a lot of discussions with new RFCs and people pro proposing new RFCs, so I mean, what uh, help us make file sharing in peer to peer network placing fast. So go to the Beyond BitSwap uh, repo and give us any feedback or, or any insight that you may have and join us in this amazing quest. <laughs> and I guess that is so from my side. I don't know if there are questions because I can see the chat. Great, Alfonso, thank you. And I, there are certainly questions and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Uh, for folks watching the recording, if you want to get involved or learn more about this work, I will be sure to post um, links like to that Beyond BitSwap repo in the description. So check those out. You can also email us at research at protocol.ai if you have uh, questions or, or want to interact more directly. Uh, so moving to the Q&A, there's a lot of stuff in the chat. I think um, I'm just going to let folks jump in here. Uh, if you do have a question, just type question into the chat. The first thing that came up was from Spiros. Uh, Spiros, did you want to ask that question? Oh, oh, well, yes, yeah. I was, um, it was a bit intrigued by the fact that you, you mentioned um, that, uh, Alfonso, that uh, uh, read requests are, are being registered, are being written on the ledger, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And I was wondering whether this is going to be a bottleneck in terms of uh, throughput, like if you, if you need support a given throughput in terms of CIDs per second over the whole network. Uh, okay, so, so, and we will have a professional writing for the ledger. That's all. Yeah, so the ledger is not a, <laughs> an, so if the ledger in the end is a, a value key store, a local data store, where we keep track of- Is it local? Sorry, is it a local thing? It's yeah, 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 it's, it's, yeah, it's in my okay. view. So, so everything, sorry, yeah, yeah, I should have explained I assume the blockchain, yes. Okay. No, 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 sorry, yeah, the naming may not be the best, <laughs> but that's good <laughs> that we realize. So here, all this, this is local. So this is within the premises of yeah. your BitSwap node. So, and this is outside. So that's why we put yeah. here like this providing subsystem because it's like, we, you need an interface to interact, but this is your local mm -hmm. node. So everything is referring to the top ledger. Okay, thank you. Yeah, the naming is not the best, yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay, that's clear enough. There was, there was uh, some contributions from Hannah in the chat. Uh, Hannah, do you have any questions that you want to ask? I, I think 
the, I just want to clarify one thing towards the end. Um, by the way, I, I, I'm assuming this is being recorded and uh, it is super useful for anyone who's about to develop on BitSwap any, in general, um, uh, just for the future for notes. <laughs> um, because explaining the concepts is like, there's very little talks that actually walk through all of this. Um, uh, and, and the, the uh, question I just want to confirm, like, you were talking about the duplicate problem um, and the idea of using an asymmetric approach. You, you, I would think that you could, because like it looked like in the relay, you know, BitSwap has the the, the want and then the want block. Um, uh, and um, I would think that you could use like the want part, which doesn't send the block to do the relay and then directly connect to the yeah. other peer for the actual want. Is that what you're talking about with asymmetric? Uh, yeah. So yeah. the idea is right now we're, but then there are other implications because here, yeah, yeah. right now we are just adding a TTL and we don't keep track of the source of the original request. Uh, okay, if, got if it. We, so we need to also uh, forward the, the source, the original source of the request so that we can establish the connection and have some kind, I mean, use these one halves as you, as you suggested as discovery yeah. and not for the full, but yeah, I mean, we wanted to go for the symmetric approach because it was the most straightforward and more like, less intrusive. Yeah. yeah. But but for this to work at scale, we probably need to add this source and do what you suggest of just using yeah, the one yeah. half as exploration. Yeah. And we all I mean and also we provide some guarantees around like not storing blocks that the user yeah. of the node did not re request. So we want to make sure yeah. we have sort yeah. of so right now there's some kind of garbage. So the moment you I mean, in the relay session, you keep track of who's asking what, and when you yeah. forward the block, you remove it from your block store because- Oh, nice. That makes sense. Cool. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, there's probably a lot of optimization to be done in the implementation for sure. Cool, I love it. Uh, Pitar, go ahead. Yeah, uh, okay, so I had a couple, a couple of questions. One is on the compression slide, so, um, and you may have already answered this, but essentially, so you were comparing sort of putting compression at three different I don't know, you want to call it an inter interface boundaries, for instance, or whatever, you know, block level, or like, I forget what the middle one was in stream level at the very top. Um, yes, um, right. So, and, and, and anyway, so what I recall was that they basically had different performance kind of uh, outcome. Um, mm -hmm. But the thing that I wanted to ask is this, um, compression algorithms in general, their performance depends so in comp in the of the, it depends on the block size but i'm not talking about the ipf like our notion of a block size but yeah. every compression algorithm has a look ahead basically how many blocks yeah. and you can so for in and you can you know you can view all of them as streaming but really what's happening inside is they're waiting for some amount of space and some amount of data to come in and they compress it so my question was yeah uh whether yeah whether you varied different algorithms and different yeah. block sizes for compression, yeah. So we tried, and this is something that uh, I checked because of course, like with really small messages, these, I mean, the overhead that you were incurring because of the block size was too much. And we tried like different configuration, actually it's in the blog post, I think we tried oh, no, different no, configuration. Pause, pause, pause. This is interesting what you just said because with really small messages, you don't have overhead, but I think what you're referring to, you don't have compression. You introduce overhead. overhead. You introduce overhead by yeah. sort of starting, probably you by- You need to send the tables. So you, you need to send the compression tables and it's a really small message and you send the compression table. So you're adding additional information okay. into the into the message that wasn't there in-, in But yeah. fortunately, BitSwap messages are large enough. So okay. we don't incur in that overhead. Okay, actually, that's actually interesting that you mentioned because really there's two overheads, right? So one is the space overhead of the yeah. table that you just mentioned. And the second one that was in my mind was that the larger your compression block size is, that's where you can really inc increase the compute time because somebody like BZIP does, you know, if you have N items, BZIP has N square runtime, whereas um, simpler algorithms like Huffman codes have linear time in the block size. So I was kind of like, my mind was in the computational. Yeah, but, but you're also right. Like one of the things, actually this, I mean, we started this after checking some of the work around compression from Dropbox because they were exploring this broccoli that in the end is like the broadly uh, compressor, but like 
stream so i mean uh, there was a lot of work there and that's why we tried this uh, stream level compression we used jzip in the end like jzip has the problem you mentioned like with different configuration with the hoffman one was great because the, it's linear it's fast but then the the bandwidth saving was too small and if we got with a high rate of compression it was pretty shitty because there was a computational overhead but then we went to broadly and broadly is really good at that and that's why i mean we used it because uh um I mean, everyone was reporting really good results with it. And we did, the, we used the C implementation of Broadly and bind it to, through Go. And that worked way better than, than GCIP. Because it's, it has this, um, like, I don't know, I'm not an expert, so I would have to, I don't recall the details, but it has some details that it made it better and more suitable for our, and that's why it's currently used in, in HTTP. So okay. in the end, like we were trying to port all the work done around compression in HTTP into our our context. Oh, awesome, awesome. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and by the way, I'm just curious. Is this like, this is in production already? No, <laughs> I don't think so. Oh, no, <laughs> so no. It's, it's everything implemented, but but there's no PR yet. It's all in some forks. Oh, okay. Well, because 75% oh. is a pretty, pretty serious, right? Yeah. I mean, you have to see, there was, so uh, there's a twist here. Um, this, I mean, if you go with media data sets, this is not as good because mm. with text, compressors are really good with text and where there's redundancy. But for media, uh, for, for instance, like data sets of large images, uh, this is a problem because they're all, they, the type of compression that they use uh, is not optimized for this kind of, of, of information. Uh, actually, so, so with I, this, what I mean is that uh, let, that's let, why it's, let yep. me just pause you. I think the reason it doesn't work for images or other things is because they're compressed. You can't get more compression. Yeah, you... yeah. But but also when they're compressed, the kind of redundancy that they get is not the same. Okay. Yeah. Or, or, or the like that's why they use other compression. So we were even thinking that you could uh, configure your compressor. So according to the data that you're exchanging, you could yeah. choose the one that better suits you. So yeah, yeah. I mean everything is there. It, it, we can I... have a look at it again. I see, I see. Okay, so there's basically a hurdle about figuring out maybe like adaptively changing the compression yeah. somehow. Okay. Um, so that's why this is up to a 75%, but in the blog post I, I mentioned it, like with, <laughs> with caution, because it depends on the data you're exchanging and the compression you're using. It's okay. really dependent. Cool. My other thing, I just had one uh, quick one. Uh, it actually seems to be slightly related to one other question that you're gonna get. But I mean, first of all, I, I think the slides were awesome. And I would add just one slide. The only one thing that I think maybe somebody is confused about, because um, you talk about bit swap, traversing the DAC tree, etc., etc., etc. But really, it's not bit swap doing these things, right? It's 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 yeah. whoever is using bit swap. And so I, I think what, what, uh, like a very important aspect of the bit swap that kind of to, you know so, you know kind of like confused me initially, and also it's like an aspect that introduces all of the uh, some of the problems that we have is really what the interface boundary is. So if you had like one slide that, that really makes it clear that the application that uses bit swap creates a session, an abstract thing, a session, and then it piecemeal asks it for CIDs. You know, first it asks it for the root ID and then bit swap just gets it. And then the application actually opens it, reads it, discovers that it has children, and then asks for the children again at the same session. But BitSwap never knows that these are actually. I, I don't think so. In the current implementation of BitSwap, I think it knows. So a session does this, but it leverages the the interface of the DHT in order to to get more peers in the session. But I don't know if it so. Uh -huh. Are you sure? Like, I mean, I, 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 I have to check in the get blocks you start. So when you get, because you have the get block and the get blocks mm -hmm. and in the get blocks, you're searching. I, I would have to check. I, I don't recall right now. Okay. But okay. If you're also inspecting the link, but yeah, you're right. I mean, I, I agree that it has no knowledge about the DAX structure. You need someone to orchestrate all of the back and forth and to know where to stop and, and what blocks to ask for. Okay. Cool. I think uh, I think George has a question in this same uh, stream here. Yeah, I mean, I'm mostly curious about what you just said in answer to in answering Petar's question about about images, right? Because of course, if you're going to to if your source material is all images, then well, you, you can use 
lossy coding and then of course you you, you mm -hmm. do compress a lot uh, or you can use was with compression and but if you go for instance with i don't know png that's that's basically filtering uh, followed by default right so it's 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 not completely atypical compression i wouldn't expect the difference to be i mean if you were compressing raw images like rasters like bmps yes. i would expect you to still get rather good performance although obviously no yeah. one i mean there aren't that many bmps in use anymore right so i, I was wondering if you have actual so numbers for I, how we, worse it is uh, we don't have numbers so my okay. i think i don't think we we will reach the up to 75 percent that's what I was uh, yeah. trying to say, but it's true that we didn't try with a raw like data set. Actually, we, we could try that because that would be because I would expect you to. I mean, like BMPs or or any PCM coding for for video are so redundant that you could get even in, well in excess of seventy five percent. So I'm curious. Obviously, if you are compressing JPEG, as yeah, yeah, that, said, your so margin is zero, right? <laughs> it's already there's there's no redundancy yeah. there. So, no, no, so and actually, you introduce overhead because you're not finding redundancy, and it happens like with small. Yeah. What we realize it's happening like with small packets that we end up adding an overhead in terms of size because of okay, the tables. Cool. There's a question in the chat that's sort of at a more basic level, which is how do you pick bit swap neighbors in the first place? You let you don't <laughs> you leverage the currently established connections in your node. So, I mean, in the end, an IPFS node, for instance, establishes connection according to uh, previous interactions with nodes, and it leverages that connection that it has to broadcast the the message. Alfonso, thank you for this talk. This was a lot of fun, and it's a great representation of of a lot of the amazing work that Resnet Lab has been doing over the past however many months. So we're super happy to have you on board here. Uh, our next talk is in two weeks, March 9th at 1700 UTC from Jonathan Bootle, who is a researcher in the foundational cryptography group at IBM Research in Zurich. His talk will be on zero knowledge succinct arguments with a linear time prover. Uh, if you watch these talks, you know what I'm going to say next. Please like, subscribe, and share this video. Sign up for our mailing list at the bottom of our webpage. Uh, you can choose to receive emails on future talks, funding opportunities, events, and general research updates from Proto Labs. Thanks for joining, everyone. We will see you next time.